Attention, people are standing. A great injustice has been done to you. For decades, the spineless bureaucrats of your government have been selling you and your fellow citizens piece by piece. The Indian scum outside our borders and to the noble prostitutes. They agree, only matched by the absolute disregard for the values that made humanity great in the first place. My brothers and sisters have watched me feed on the dying carcass and fire for one another. The passengers are human, she and the children are human. It's clear that the government is happy to sell the vile parts of humanity into servitude. The time has come to send a message that we will not consume their lives in war. That we are the ones in charge. Stanton will be the first step in a revolution to take back soul of the Empire. You will be witnesses. We are settled for it. Out. Xenothread is easily the most well-balanced event that Star Citizen has to offer. Mixing space combat, FPS combat, and hauling, it's got a little bit of everything for most everyone to enjoy, and thanks to the newest update plus the upgrade to the event, it's easily become the best one that they've run yet. However, it's set more on fire than just the ships in game, showing that there's still a way to go before CIG's new server tech matures. Join me then as we dive into why you won't want to miss what this event has to offer, why you won't want to go it alone, and why it can still use to be improved. One other thing you won't want to miss though is the sponsor of today's video. World of Tanks Sometimes when I get a bit sick of watching spaceships go boom, I like to unwind a little bit by watching tanks go boom. I make them go boom. I imagine that every tank I blow up then is a bug in Star Citizen. It's actually pretty cathartic. World of Tanks then, if you didn't know, is a free-to-play armored warfare-themed online multiplayer game chocked full of over 800 cool historical and non-historical tanks that you can drive into massive battles in over 40 different arenas by yourself or with some friends. I actually started playing World of Warships many years ago, and that's what got me into trying World of Tanks since it's made by the same developer. And if you wanted to hop in with me and over 100 million other players, you can check out the link in the description below of the video and use code COMBAT to get 7 days of free premium access, 250,000 credits, a Cromwell B, and some very cool rental tanks. Oh, and if you've already played before and you're coming back, you can still get three days of premium access, a camouflage, and some very cool kit by using that same code. So again, check out that link in the description below as well as the details for the offer, and blow off some steam by blowing up a few tanks. So CIG really put a lot of effort into making Xenothreat a lot better than the previous versions, and they started with improving the way that you're introduced to the mission. The description is a lot better, and they actually asked Agent Dooley, also known as Anna Demetrio, the voice actor, to come back and do some more voice lines to explain other parts of the mission that weren't as clear in previous iterations. And this helped to fill a lot of gaps for new players coming in to join us over the weekend when we held this for my org, as we didn't need to stop and explain things over and over again. The mission finally explained itself well enough that people could figure it out on their own. Not only that, the map system was a huge help in getting everybody to the right location with the new markers without too much fuss. Another really big thing that's changed you may have already noticed is that the location of Xenothread has changed to the Pyro Warp Gate. I actually suggested this in a video not to say that they took my suggestion, but it just made a lot of sense to do it this way because Pyro is where they're coming from in lore, so this is probably where we should defend them from invading the Stanton system. So it's cool to see this be the location just for the sake of lore, but also it's visually stunning. It is a great backdrop for doing combat, and they didn't just leave it as was, they also added some very cool new set pieces including this massive hollowed out asteroid which I recognized from the pyro test that we'd done last year, so I think that they brought some pyro assets over. Makes a lot of sense, why not use it, they're fantastic, and I, I'm really happy to see them putting a lot more effort into mission settings like this. Talking about the objective though, it's the same basic principal objective as it was for the previous iterations. We need to go and find the supply ships that have been destroyed by the Xenothreat and boarded, and reacquire the supplies to give to the Javelin to prepare it for the upcoming fight for the invasion of Stanton with the big capital fleet that they're going to bring over. 
And while this is happening, there's also Xeno Threat in the area, occasionally coming in to attack you to stop you from taking the supplies back. This is where things get a lot more exciting with an org or a group of people. You're coordinating to have yourself defended, while some of you are on board the ship, clearing it out, and then getting that very valuable cargo on board to bring back to the Javelin. And I do want to talk about the boarding experience, but before we get into that, I wanted to talk about the space combat here a bit in this first phase, because it is quite a bit different than what you might have experienced if you've played this same event in the past. Namely, the big change that came in 3.23 with the change to the flight model called Master Modes. To refresh your memory just really quick, there's two new modes. You've got SCM mode and Nav mode, and in Nav mode you can't use your shields or weapons, but you can travel really fast and go into Quantum. And in the inverse, with the SCM mode, you're able to use your weapons and your shields, but you're limited to around 200, 220 meters a second, depending on the ship and depending on the boost that you're able to put out and for how long you're able to put it out for. The effect of this is that it slowed down combat speeds, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it slowed down combat. Furballs can still get really intense, and I would say there's still skill involved with this mode. Sure, there's a lot of work left to do, and that's not really the point of this video to break down master modes too much, but the general gist of the experience in this version is that due to these slower speeds, the tracking of AI is much better than it was in the past. Instead of going 2 kilometers relative speed to an enemy, you're now traveling something maybe closer to 400 meters a second relative speed, and that means they can actually track and hit you. This has made it very dangerous to go into a big furball where there's more enemy NPCs than you. But the way I'm looking at it, it just means that there's now an actual challenge when it comes to fighting NPCs, especially in these big events where there's lots and lots of them. And this has also made big ships like the Hammerhead and even the Idris very deadly to small ships. We'll dive more into that once we get into Phase 2. But 323 didn't just change the way that space combat happened, it's also improved FPS combat and EVAing, and this has made the whole experience of getting cargo off of these cargo ships and even getting onto them and fighting the NPCs a heck of a lot better. I love that I don't feel like I'm fighting the game in order to EVA around anymore. And of course, the new gunplay, as well as the improved AI from NPCs, has made the combat a lot better aboard these ships. However, the AI is still very much reliant on the server's performance, and if there's a lot of people participating in the event, well, you may encounter NPCs that just don't respond at all. 3.23 seems to have made the server tick rate just a little bit better. It's incremental, but overall, it's still not where it needs to be for a AAA, quadruple A game. For your reference, I personally experienced something around 11 to 15 FPS when I was playing during the event, but I'm playing on the Asia servers, so there are fewer people just in general playing Star Citizen over there right now. After reaching the cargo bay, you may also discover that the weapon FPS combat isn't the only thing to have changed for this part of the mission. There are also brand new, larger versions of the three types of materials that we need to collect from the supply ships. I'm talking full 1 to 2 SU sized containers that actually snap to the grids of your ship, making for a bit easier transport than the smaller handheld ones. Though those ones still exist, meaning that if you're taking a smaller ship to support the event, you're still going to be able to participate. After you've collected up the cargo, then just like the previous event, you need to bring it back to the station. In this case, it's the Pyro Jump Point Station, which they're also calling INS Jericho now. That's the end part where the Javelin is parked. You need to land on the pads next to it and then go up to one of the cargo terminals located just to the side of those pads and then sell it directly from your ship's cargo. And just to make things interesting, while you're doing this, the station may at any time come under attack where your ship might be blown up straight off the pad. So coordinating a defense needs to happen not just when you're picking up the cargo, but also when you're dropping it off. Simultaneously, when the Xenothreat is attacking the station, they're actively trying to blow the Javelin up. So you'll get a new health bar that pops up as part of the mission information in the upper right hand corner to tell you how much damage the Javelin has taken. And what you see is what you get. If the weapons have been knocked off the Javelin, when it flies over there, if it's still able to fly, it'll have no weapons. So it is actually the same Javelin that you'll see fighting in the final phase. Thankfully, in phase one, you don't really need to blow the Idris up. You just need to blow up its escorts and it'll retreat. So it's not too hard of a fight, but you've got to pay attention and fight back. Otherwise, it's going to be much harder in phase two. 
But the beauty of this first part of the event is that if you don't want to do combat, you don't have to. You can just do the shipping bit and make an extra buck. Selling these items to the station not only completes the objective, but gives you extra side cash. I think I made like 300k extra cash alone from doing this. But if by chance you don't want to hop off your ship and grab a tractor beam to help out loading a ship full of cargo boxes, well, you can still contribute in a new way in this new version of Xenothreat. Occasionally, Agent Dooley will announce that there's a supply ship that's in need of assistance, and if you go nearby the icon that spawns, you'll get a message from the ship's captain that they're in need of assistance. If you hold off there and defend the ship for a period of time, the supply ship will eventually quantum back to the station and contribute to the totals that are left. And it's not an insubstantial sum, it can actually get you a fair way towards finishing this phase of the mission, allowing you to progress to part 2. It can sometimes be very slow to complete this part of the mission though, and I've discovered that if you don't hunt down all of the enemies that it spawns, it will never leave. So like so many other things in Star Citizen, it's got some issues. But it's a pretty good alternative if you're playing by yourself or Reached with a couple of friends. Pull up on supplies. Come out. One thing I definitely didn't like and I think contributed a lot to some of the performance issues that we were experiencing throughout each and every session was the obnoxious amount of leftover abandoned player ships and ship debris that was just left over from previous events. And while the persistence tech has certainly created some really cool situations in Star Citizen, I don't think it has a place here in the event, as it sometimes literally gets in the way. I had myself and a few other players in my group explode because of this debris not loading in until the last second. So if it were up to me with how I would do the next version of this, I would definitely introduce some kind of tech that cleans up stuff much more quickly in this area, perhaps between events as they happen to make sure that the playing field is completely free of leftover stuff come the next round. Hopefully this helps with performance, helps with random explosions, and also cleans up the HUD. And by the way, the HUD also needs a bit of work when it comes to lots of different players on the screen or icons. It becomes way more than just a little overwhelming. But despite these problems, I still had a lot of fun in part one, and it didn't detract too much from the event for me. The real issues started in part two. So in part two of this event, you're tasked with going out and stopping the Xenothreat invasion, and it's basically an Idris with an escort of hammerheads and a bunch of light, medium, and heavy fighters that you have to fend off. The objective is to destroy the Idris, but there's a twist to this new version of it. As an alternative to just blowing it up, you can board the Idris, which now has a bespoke interior for this event themed in Xenothreat, where you have to fight your way through a ton of enemy AI to get to the bridge and neutralize the big bad, plus you get his armor if you're the first one there. It's an extremely cool part of the event, in theory, but it doesn't play out that way most of the time. There are some issues with this part of the event that have made it, well, let's just say a bit impossible to play by yourself or with a very small group of people. Let me show you exactly what I mean. See this Idris, the way it's shooting at me and it's tracking me? Oh, hey, there, yeah, I'm dead. And this wasn't a one-off experience. This was happening to everybody. The moment that the Idris singled them out, they would evaporate. And this actually comes down to a possible issue with the size five guns on the ship. Apparently they're doing 9,000 damage per round. I don't know how that information was gleaned out of the game. I don't think those files are public. So I'm gonna just say that is speculation, but the results are pretty clear. It is very, very hard to approach this thing without dying instantly. Making matters worse is that the hammerheads are also no joke. If they're alive and you get close to them, they'll focus fire you just as well and blow you up nearly as fast. We tried blowing up the hammerheads from a distance to give us a little bit of a reprieve, but even that was difficult because they would stick pretty close to the Idris the whole time. The only thing that we found to work in a group of four with almost nobody on the server participating was to stay back with torpedo ships and simultaneously launch volleys of torps at the hammerheads first and then go after the Idris. But with this strat, it didn't leave us any ship to be able to approach the Idris safely and board it, which is one of the coolest parts of this new version of the event. Which is why the only really good way to do this is with a large group of people or with a server that's got a lot of people actively participating because they'll divert the attention of the hammerheads as well as the Idris to allow you to get close enough to actually board it. Only it's probably not going to play out like you think it will for getting on board the Idris, 
unless you get extremely lucky. Clearly something broke between when they recorded this first gameplay footage and when we got the event in our hands. Now if you don't know, if you use a ballistic weapon, you can actually pierce the shields of pretty much any ship and force a door open by doing enough damage to it, and it does seem to kind of work on the Idris, only the door ends up closing again a few seconds later, and by the way, the Idris never stops moving this way. It's always turning, twisting, and twitching around, never really staying still enough for you to board in anything, let alone a very squishy Pisces. Which is why I said you need to be extremely lucky to board it in the way that they showed. The way I got in twice now is the way I just showed you. By ejecting out of my ship and then using a tractor beam to pull myself close enough to phase through the hull. Not the most exciting or romantic way that you might have imagined when looking at the first part of this video, is it? I also heard that some people were just flying up straight next to it and then ejecting at the right time to just eject through the hull and end up inside of the hangar bay here. But the effect is pretty much the same. The best and most reliable way to get on board right now is to phase into it. Now once you manage to actually get inside of it, it does become a lot of fun if you've brought enough ammo and if you've got a friend. I say that because even though the AI weren't particularly responsive in this experience, there were enough of them that I ran out of ammo a couple of times and had to take cover to reload and in that time I got shot. Making matters probably a bit worse is that while this is all going on, there's a big fight outside of the ship because it's not stopped like I think they had originally planned, meaning performance is just in the tank. This causes things to be generally a little bit unresponsive and got me nearly killed a number of times. Here for example, I pulled my pistol out and tried to shoot and, and nothing happened. Luckily I survived this encounter, but eventually I ran out of luck. Imagine my disappointment in that very moment when I was the only one in the server to get aboard and I died like that. <laughs> oh man. And did I mention that the javelin never fired at the Idris once? Yeah, so that was a bug as well. Suffice it to say then, the event had a lot of good stuff going for it. The combat's great, the new flight model I think works pretty well for an NPC driven event but there were still clearly a lot of issues. That hammerhead you see is actually an NPC hammerhead attacking its own Idris. I, I don't know why. There were just so many issues with the last phase of this event that it was very rare to be able to complete it without anything noticeably going wrong. And that's a shame because this is clearly the coolest iteration of the event that CIG have had and probably the coolest event CIG have tried to run period. Being able to board a giant capital ship and fight your way to the bridge to fight a boss is the stuff of science fiction dreams. But of course this is Star Citizen we're talking about so nothing exactly goes as planned. But I still had a lot of fun with the event. I'm kind of used to this by now, maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome, you let me know down below. Did you enjoy the event? If you did, let me know why and what parts you liked and if you had problems let me know what things Things you hope they can improve for the next time and not just finish the game. Please come up with something a bit more creative. By the way, the winner of the MISC pack from the 3.23 video is 5 and 9, so congratulations to you. And if you want to see more content like this or possibly be part of a giveaway in the future, please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And as always, I hope to see you guys in the next one.